we got to dive in here. Uh, this is the end of theology for everyone. And we are in a season called Theology for Everyone because theology is for there you go. Theology's for everyone. And today we're talking about the end. <laughs> hey, I, I share the, the same sentiment. Uh, I'll be honest with you. This is probably the most difficult subject for me um, that there is in Scripture. I don't, I don't feel like I have a ton of grace in this area. It's funny. You emailed me that you were coming. The dean of my doctoral program is here today, and he emailed me that he was coming. I thought, could you just come on any week but, but the end times? Could you get any week but eschatology? So if I don't graduate next spring, you can probably bet uh, I missed it somewhere in here. No, Dr. Dr. V. Hill, super glad you're here. Thanks for preaching last Father's Day, too. That was awesome to have you, and so glad that you're in the house. But for real, end times, here we go. Uh, let me read you our doctrinal statement, and then we'll, we'll dive in. We believe Jesus will rapture the church before the tribulation, that Jesus will return before the millennial reign to overthrow the Antichrist, and he will rule for a thousand years with his followers. We believe in the bodily resurrection of all humanity, the everlasting conscious bliss of all who truly believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the everlasting conscious punishment is the portion of all those whose names are not written in the book of life. That sounds intense, right? That's a good one. Um, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, when it comes to this, and I'll tell you why it's a challenge for me, is uh, I, I tend to side with Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 36, he says, However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. The challenge is there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of things that we don't know. And, I, and I'll, I'll follow that up with there's a lot of wackadoodles in this space that say they know. They've been saying they know for years, and they've been predicting the end for years, and they've been saying this is the day of the Lord, this is the year of the Lord, Jesus will return, all the way up to, and I'll tell you, there's one I love, I really, really respect him as a, as a Bible scholar, and he was convinced that in September of 2021, Feast of Trumpets, Jesus was returning. Israel was, was peddling with war at that time. There were some things that were rising up. And he was so convinced, he had me convinced. I was celebrating my birthday, and I was like, wow, it's going to be the last one. <laughs> Love it. Hope it's good. Kiss my kids every night before bed. And, and I don't know, we're almost a year past that now. So uh, the challenge is it, there's a lot of unknown. So here's what I want to do today. I want to stick with what we know. I'm going to stick with what we know, which means I am not going to try and read Ezekiel 38 to you and tell you which nation's Russia and which nation's Turkey and who the Antichrist is and all of those things because we don't know. Nobody knows right now, okay? So we're going to, we're going to move on from what we don't know and we're going to talk about what we do know. Let me give you two sources, by the way. Um, two sources where if you really, really like this so that you don't get off track or follow, a wackadoodle in this area, right? Um, number one is Dr. David Jeremiah. He's, and he's a Baptist theologian for all my Baptists in the room. He is a wonderful end times theologian. I think all of his stuff is great. The second is Jimmy Evans. He's a spirit-filled theologian. He is, uh, so there we have our charismatics, we have our Baptists, and they both believe the same thing. How ironic is that, right? And follow whichever one you wish, Follow both of them. They both have incredible resources. I'll tell you, I did my study, and then I filtered everything that I landed on through their lenses of theology, and I feel like we're going to land somewhere today. Let me just tell you this. I hate the phrase end times because it, it connotates something negative. Um, there is nothing negative about what we're going to talk about today. There is nothing, if you, well, let me change that. There's nothing negative if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, this is going to rock your world today. 
you are going to, hopefully you become a believer in Jesus, but there is, if we're followers of Jesus, there is no need to panic. There's no need to freak out. In fact, these should be comforting words. These should be encouraging words. That's what Paul says. This should bring hope to those who feel hopeless. This should be encouragement that we give to each other, okay? Uh, in the sermon notes, I gave you a timeline Ooh, man. Let me, let me run through it really, really quick, okay? And then you can go back. There's a bunch of scripture references there. Um, here is a timeline that I think we see really clearly in scripture is how things play out. And I actually uh, preached this in a message a while back in Time's Response and, and went a little more in depth in it. But uh, number one, I think the thing we're going to see first, Ezekiel chapter 38, is the Gog Magog War. I think Israel is going to find themselves alone. They're going to find the neighboring nations around them rising up against them, and they're going to attack Israel, and Israel is going to be alone at war with no ally. At that point, I think the rapture of the church takes place. It's second, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Corinthians 15. After that, the Antichrist will rise. I don't think we as Christians will ever know who the Antichrist is. We will not be here. You, you may. You can, you can stay if you want. I'm on the first elevator up. I'm, I'm out of here. When the Gog Magog War breaks out and the rapture happens, I'm gone, okay? Uh, then the Antichrist negotiates a peace treaty with Israel. The tribulation begins. Three and a half years into the, great tri into the tribulation is the great tribulation. The Antichrist breaks his peace treaty with Israel. At that point, at the end of the seven years, Jesus returns with his followers, overthrows the Antichrist. There's a millennial reign of a thousand years where the enemy's thrown into the lake of fire. He comes out. He's destroyed forever. New heaven, new earth. God comes down and dwells with his people forever. That's the timeline. Now, like I said, we're going to stick today with what we know. There is a, uh, this is really interesting if you think about it, especially because, um, well, that's, that's another story. But uh, newspapers have a type, a font that they call the second coming font. And any time there is crazy news that happens, the unbelievable news on mass proportion that occurs, they use what is called the second coming type as their headlines. On December 7th, 1941, when we were bombed in Oahu, this was the headline in second coming font, Oahu bombed by Japanese planes. It is, it is a second coming font. 1948, Israel becomes a nation. We have that headline as well. You can see it's the second coming font. It is big, it is bold, it's at the top, and it captures attention. November 1963, JFK is assassinated. We have that on, there you go. It is the second coming font. Font. We have July 21, 1969, Armstrong walks on the moon. We'll see there is men walk on the moon again in second coming font. May 2, 2011, Osama bin Laden is assassinated and the New York Times used in a smaller but same font, the second coming font font. Isn't it interesting that our world, our news reporting from years and years, almost 100 years ago, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago to, to today, uses a font to capture what would be unbelievable, magnitude-esque, like incomprehensible news. If it's world-shaking, if it's life-changing, if it's future-altering, they call in the newsroom for second coming font, put it on the headline. Those are all big events, but I think when we, when we talk about the end times, we have to realize we have the actual headline. I, in fact, I can't wait for this headline to show up, guys. That's the headline, Jesus Christ returns. We will see that one day in second coming font, bold across all of the newspapers, and I hope you're not here to read it, right? But it's happening. It's coming and it's going to happen. And this is great news. This is hope and this is encouragement. Okay, here is what we know. And this is what we're going to stick to what we know. I'm going to give you, as we've done every single week, an orthodoxy, a right belief, right? And then I'm going to give you an orthopathy, a right heart. And then I'm going to give you an orthopraxy, a right praxis, a practice. So the end is coming. What do we believe how does that impact our heart? 
and what do we do because of it? All right, here's our orthodoxy. This is what we believe. Jesus will, these three things, rapture, return, and rule. Jesus will, this is what we believe. And this would, this would summarize that entire timeline as well. What do we believe when it comes to the end? We believe that Jesus will come and he will rapture the church. That we, in a moment, in the blink of an eye, like a thief in the night, shh, we will be gone. There will be a, sack of, a pile of clothes laying there, but we won't be there. We will be gone. We believe Jesus will return to rapture. He will return in the second coming, and he will rule. Let me walk you through all three of these. This will be the bulk of where we spend our time. So I think getting these right is really important for our theology. Number one is the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Paul says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you do not grieve like people who have no hope. As we're talking about the end, you should not be grieving. You should not be worried. You should not be fearful. You should not come across like somebody with no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. For the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Verse 17. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with him forever. Verse 18, so encourage each other with these words. There are um, teachings out there that call for mid-tribulation rapture, a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, Can't really wrap my mind around it. I'm going to walk you through another couple passages that I think really refute that and show us a pre-tribulation rapture. In other words, the rapture occurs quickly. It is us going to the Lord before the tribulation, the time of the pouring out of the wrath of the Lamb happens. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. For they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forever. And we will, who are living will also be transformed. Revelation 3, 10 through 11. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. What did you just hear? This is setting up the end times from Revelation 4 to Revelation 19. It's all about the tribulation, the second coming. And he's saying, I'm going to protect you from that time. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. In fact, I think this is even more interesting. Revelation 1 through 3 gives extensive instruction to the early church, the first century church. It's giving them extensive instruction of how to walk through all of these situations. And not once from Revelation 4 to Revelation 22 verse 15, Ecclesia, the church on earth, not once is it mentioned. Not once in any of the epistles is there any preparatory warning for us to prepare ourselves to endure or go through the tribulation. Not once is it mentioned. Why? We're not here. Surprise, we're not here. It's not mentioned because we're not part of it. It is, it is this idea, you know, it, there, there are some that would say, well, God, uh, some who believe in a, in a, po- a mid or a post-tribulation rapture, right? well, God's going to protect us through the tribulation. There's one challenge with that. Believers are not protected during the tribulation. In fact, they're targeted and they're killed. Listen to Revelation 13, 5 through 7. This is speaking to the time of the wrath, the pouring out of the wrath of the Lamb. This is during the tribulation. He says, then 
the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God. And he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7, and the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and the people and language and nation. That is so contrary to what Paul says life in Christ is. In the tribulation, believers are allowed to be conquered. In Christ, I am more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me, right? Right? During the tribulation, there is condemnation, there is wrath. It is the outpouring of the wrath of the Lamb. But Paul says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I believe as clear as we can read through Scripture, there is a pre-tribulation rapture. So we have the rapture. Jesus is going to return to rapture. Now, the second thing is the return. The rapture is private. The return is public. The rapture is bringing us up with him. The return is us coming down with him as his army. We are in arms with Jesus to overthrow the Antichrist. Matthew 24, 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will give light, no light, and the stars will fall from the sky. And the powers in heavens will be shaken. This is Jesus. And then <coughs> at last, The sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Listen to Revelation 19, 11 through 21. This is a totally different event. You have the rapture, which is a quick moment. It's private. No one knows when it's coming. No one knows when it's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, we are pulled from here, from earth, to heaven to be with the Lord. The second coming is a public exclamation of the arrival of the king on a white horse. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages righteous war. Verse 12, his eyes were like flames of fire. I love that. Can we write a song about that? Eyes of fire? We'll call it eyes, art creative, eyes of fire, coming soon. I can, oh, coming soon. Did I punch you, right? His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure linen, followed him on a white horse. Verse 15, from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe, at his thigh, was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You people who hate tattoos, Jesus is going to have one down his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That'd be a pretty cool tattoo, actually. This little thigh tat. I know those are in now. All right. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, come, gather together for the great banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, of all humanity, both free and slaves, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one on the, on the horse and his army. Verse 20, and the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles as the Antichrist, miracles that deceived all who accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. And the vultures all 
gorge themselves on their dead bodies. The return is the battle. It is the victory. It is the public exclamation of the reestablishment of the rule and reign of Jesus here on earth. So then we have the rapture, we have the return, and now we have the rule. And then I promise you we're going to bring all of this together. You with me? Are you with me? Okay. Let's finish with the rule. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. It's the millennial reign. After he must be released for a little while. Skip down Revelation 27 through 8. So he's released. He starts doing the deception again. It says, when the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore, Revelation 20.10. Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. So he's overthrown again. He's conquered again. He and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, it continues. And I saw a great white throne and, all, and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And now here is eternal, continual bliss with our Lord. We are raptured. We return with Jesus as his army. We overthrow the Antichrist and the beast. He is thrown into a thousand year pit. He comes out. He is destroyed forever. And then this is the glorious moment. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. What do we believe? We believe that the rapture will take place in a moment and it will take place before the tribulation and bring us to Jesus and then we will come down during the return and we will be part of his army during the return and we will see God come and rule and reign forever among us, establishing a new heaven and a new earth. Listen, this is power for us. This is strength for us. This should not be scary news. We should not be freaking out about this. We should be saying, I can't wait to get on my white horse. I can't wait to join the army. I can't wait for the return. It drives me crazy. Uh, I hear so many people talking about, oh, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and it's terrible out there, and I can't believe everything is happening, and this, this that, and the other. You know, um, it reminds me, there, there was, do we have that picture of John Dillinger? John Dillinger was a famous 
gangster. Man, he even looks like a gangster, right? Kind of looks like a model too, but he's, he was, he's a bad guy. Um, he was a famous gangster in the 30s and 40s who was known for robbing banks. He uh, went on a bank robbing spree. As he started his career in crime uh, in, uh, at 21, he robbed a grocery store. He got arrested. He went to prison. He broke out of prison. He formed this gang, and they traveled for over a year and a half throughout Indiana. They robbed a police armory, got submachine guns, bulletproof vests, and went around viciously robbing banks all over the place. In the course of that time, he got arrested and went to prison two more times and escaped both times. So he had been arrested and put in prison three times, and he got out three different times until finally he he got caught again, and this time when he got caught, he was put in what they deemed, in fact, I'll just read to you what the New York Daily News said, Dillinger was finally locked away in a prison deemed escape proof. Yet on March 3rd, 1934, Dillinger broke out of the escape proof prison again. You know how he did it? He got a piece of wood from a washboard. And he sanded it down and he grounded it down and made it into a fake gun. And then he held up 33 prison workers. He locked them in cells. He walked them down halls. He locked them in bathrooms and in closets. And he convinced 33 prison guards he had a real gun. Locked them all up in the prison, walked out the front gate, climbed over the front wall, and walked out of prison while everyone else is locked up. And you know, it's just amazing to me. He did it with fake power. Let me tell you something. When I, when I encounter Christians who are scared, worried, nervous, freaked out about the end, you are allowing a fake power to govern your life. You are allowing a fake power to tell you what's next. You are allowing fake power to, to cause you to tremble, to have anxiety, to have fear, to be filled with worry. What does Paul say? Don't be like people with no hope. We have the hope. He's going to rapture. He's going to return, and he is going to rule, and we're going to be with him. That's what we believe. So we take what we believe, and what does that do to our heart? Let me, let me read it to you. It's our orthopathy. We let our hearts be filled with hope. Why are our hearts filled with hope? Because he will rapture, he will return, and he will rule. John 14, 1 through 3, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be troubled. The end is near. Don't be in fear. Put that in for the lyrics. That's a good one. <laughs> trust in God and trust also in me. There is, no, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you do not grieve like people who have no hope. We have hope. We're not grieving, we're not worried, we're not fearful, we're not watching the news or reading the second coming font and freaking out about anything. We are excited, we are filled with joy, we are ready for the return of our Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2. This is interesting. So 1 Thessalonians was written to the church in Thessalonica. And what happened was there was some mistranslation with the letter. People were already assuming that the day of the Lord had happened. So Paul turned around a couple weeks later and he wrote 2 Thessalonians back to them to clarify some wrong teaching, particularly about the end time. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how he will be gathered to meet and how will we gather to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed. Some of you, when I said we're talking about the end times, you were shaken and alarmed. You got, well, I want to see my grandkids grow up. What, when am I ever going to get married? Like, what's, what's the future hold for me? Don't be shaken and alarmed by this. He says, uh, don't be shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Refer back to the wackadoodles I mentioned in the beginning. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision 
a revelation or a letter supposedly from us. And then Paul continues and he says, there is a man of lawlessness and the man of lawlessness is working secretly, but he will only be able to be revealed when the one who is holding him back, who is the Holy Spirit, is out of the way. In fact, I'll just read it to you real quick. I have it. Second Thessalonians, uh, he goes, Seven through eight. He says, For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. And then listen to how Paul wraps up 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when dealing with misinterpretation of the end. He says, With all these things in mind, Dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Verse 16, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and wonderful hope. Circle eternal comfort. That is a comfort that does not leave you. That is a comfort that does not go away. It is eternal, it is everlasting, it is forever, which means there is nothing in my future that is beyond the comfort of God in my life and what he is going to comfort me through. Verse 17, comfort and comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you say and do. Um, the Flor- Florida Atlantic University did two studies. And the title of the study, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, why does home feel so good? That was the research question. Why does home feel so good? And they did it first with animals, and then they came back and did it with humans, and they found the exact same results. And, and what they did was this. They took people from their homes for an extended period of time. And then they brought them back to their home and they traced their body. And they said that when people who had been away from home for an extended period of time came back home, they had a dopamine flood in their body. Dopamines are the signalers of pleasure, of satisfaction, of joy, of happiness. They had a dopamine flood equivalent to cocaine use. You get high every time you go home. You just, you walk in, you're like, wow, this feels great, right? But then they did something interesting, right? So they have these people who are away from home for an extended period of time. They come back and all of a sudden they have this dopamine. They found people who did not identify as having a home. They just, man, I don't really have a home. My parents moved. I went to college. I came back. There's no place for me to sleep. Uh, I don't really have a home, right? And they did this study and they took them and put them in a place And then they brought them back to like a really beautiful either hotel room or a resort or an Airbnb house or something really, really nice, right, after keeping them away for a while. And here's what they noticed. They said there was zero dopamine change. Zero. Didn't matter. They could be in a terrible place, moved into a new place. And the conclusion of the study was this. A heart without a home is never satisfied. A heart without a home is never satisfied. Listen, our heart is at home with the Lord. How do, what what is the, what is the rapture, the return, and the rule of Jesus mean? It means my heart is at home. It means I know where I'm going to go. I know what's going to happen. I know who I'm going to be with. I don't have to be worried. I don't have to be fearful. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be freaking out. I have comfort and I have peace because my heart has a home with the Lord. All right, let's finish this off. Orthopraxy. What do we do? What do we do? We know the rapture, the return, and the rule of Jesus is coming. It gives my heart a home. It brings me peace. It removes all anxiety, worry, fear. I am comforted. So here's what we do. We encourage each other. We encourage each other. Hey, I know it's hard right now. Jesus is coming back. I know you're facing difficulty right now. Jesus is coming back. I know you may be going through a hard season right now, but I've got good news for you. Jesus is coming back. This is what we encourage each other with. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 through 18, he says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Listen, 
When we, when we build our foundation of theology today, when we leave here, we should be the most encouraging, life-giving, gospel-preaching, excited people on the face of the planet. Keisha is. What about the rest of us? We should be the most excited, encouraged, alive, fired up people on the face of the planet because we know what's coming. And it's good, it's comforting, it's encouraging news. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. Now listen, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you were already doing. The most encouraging thing we can do for one another is remind each other, Jesus is coming back. Hey, have courage, have hope, have excitement. Jesus is coming back. Yeah, but you don't know what I'm walking through right now. It, 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 I understand it's hard now, but Jesus is coming back. He's going to come back. The end is good. It, we win in the end. Uh, there was a man named James Gillis. I watched a documentary, a sports documentary on him, and he is one of the only guys in the world to complete two triathlons back to back uh, with a 24 hour break. And I mean, these are uh, like, what, what, Mike, help me, what is it? 26 mile run, 102 mile swim, 156 mile bike ride. Just nod with it, make me feel good about it. Yeah, okay, that's, it's, it's something, it's really, really long, right? It's a really, really long race. He did them twice back to back with a 24 hour break. He did it six times and the last time he did it, he was 59 years old, <laughs> right? Good way to go, bro. Uh, but they asked him in the documentary, they said, how on earth did you do it? And he said, well, I tried for a number of years and failed. And he said, when I was trying and failing, I realized something. And then when I finally finished it, I changed something. And the guy was like, well, tell us, tell us, tell us. And he said, I learned to quit listening to myself and to start encouraging myself. He said, when I was listening to myself, I would hear, you're tired, you're worn out, your lower back hurt, your calves are on fire, you're too old to be doing this, what on earth are you thinking? He said, when I started encouraging myself, I started saying, I can go a little further. I've got a little more in the tank. There's something that I can do. And he said, literally the only thing that changed is I learned the power of encouragement. Guys, we have the power of encouragement when it comes to the end. We don't have to be freaking out. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be afraid. In fact, it should be the most encouraging thing that we can give one another is this. Jesus will rapture, he will return, and he will rule, and we will be with him.